Okay, hello everyone and welcome back. Uh, this is the our end of day panel. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed uh, the session today and I'm receiving questions live. So if you want to send the last minute question, uh, you're more, more than welcome. I, I see all the social media here. Uh, also to the other panelists, you have received uh, the links in your email. So if you, you know, if, you, if you're okay, you can yeah. join us. I would ask people for, for panelists to wear headphones or, you know, or, 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 or something like that. And we can start. We can start. So hello, everyone. Hi there. Hello. Welcome. Hello. Yeah. Hello. I hope you've enjoyed today's session and also congratulations to you for, for these fantastic presentations. Thank you. Yes, it was very inspirational and kudos to everybody for the brilliant, brilliant work and especially then to you as well, Lutheris, for everything you. you've done. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah, thank you for your invitation. I'm so honored to present my project through Valencia Design Education Forum. It's a great event. Thank yes, you. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. And Yehuin, you were also did a fantastic workshop last year at, at the first Alicante Design Workshop Forum. So yes. it was fantastic. Good. Yeah, during the, the time of pandemic, we can bring everyone from all over the world. So it's really great opportunity to learn more about others' work and also, you know, uh, no, we get to know each other as well. Absolutely, thank you for absolutely. the opportunity. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So the the main topic of the forum, which everyone has addressed beautifully, uh, is this relationship between analog and digital, because it's almost like, uh, I mean, the, the 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 title came to me last year at the end of the last year's forum, but of course I, had, I never realized last year that I would have to really explore it. So we kind of moved from a lot of analog to a lot of digital. Uh, and so can you just share your experiences of this year and uh, how you've um, how this has impacted you on your, on your teaching and learning? Uh, any, Who any, goes any, first? Any of you? Any of you can yeah. start. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I'll go first if that's yeah. if that's yeah, fine. Sure, sure. Um, yeah. So from my side, it as with everybody, I think there was there were great challenges, um, especially in terms of thinking about how in terms of design specifically that was studio-based, we now take it forward to an online platform that I myself have experienced that you need to have the face-to-face. -face. You can't rely on technology alone. Yes, you can supplant some things in terms of theory or some certain modules, but the, the main problem with that is it will remain tacit knowledge. You will have to really engage with the students because, I mean, we can all remember and still reflect on even last year when you have, you know, a classroom environment or a studio environment. You can be as well prepared as you want, but the dialogues that remain and exist within a classroom and a studio is that what sparks these additional informations and these additional conversations that really expand on the current knowledge and, and things that you are talking about in that specific time that now have become lost to some degree because you know, the technology predictates certain things that you have to do and it's very planned and then it cohorts certain things. So there's these limitations set and, and it reminds me again of what I have to do and what I had to do just to go back to almost the foundations and, and the principle sets. So from my side specifically, I mean, I deal a lot with um, illustration and, and character designing and, and, and theory within it. And I had to then resort as well to creating an additional YouTube channel with additional you know, video material for students, but still, you know, the students go back and then and they reflect on it and they go, yes, this helps and this helps, but still there's attributes that they still are lacking. And those lacking attributes are the things that they are actually doing by themselves that you see the moment they are doing, the actual hands-on process when you are there engaging that are lacking. So you've got this disconnect, even though you are connected with technology at the same time. So you're both online and offline, even though you think you are online type of thing. And, and that you know, that hinders the process. And I think you have to then really think back on what is it in the curriculum, going multimodal, that you restructure the things that you are actually doing. Mm -hmm. Because if we know it is hands-on, then, then how do we take the online platform and say, okay, mm -hmm. so how do we go hands-on? What are the things that we recreate the studio environment? To what extent do we recreate it? And to what extent do we not? Because we know certain things, I mean, from myself, I've got things that I've tried and tested 
And uh, some work, some don't, because it's it's a new era that we all went into. Mm-hmm. And I think, you know, the avenues of, of testing and experimentation really started to work greatly for me as well, because I could see certain technologies can work and certain things can't work. And you have to hone back into the livelihood of the students. I really mm-hmm. thought very hard about the cohort of students that we have and what are their situations? Because not all of our students, for example, are connected. You can give them data, but the network coverage to some extent, you know, they, it doesn't reach them. So then they are left behind and you and you need to not have students be left behind. So you need to do different interventions so that you cater for those that, you know, are slightly facing different um, stumbling blocks than others or different hurdles than others. And at the same time, there are those students who excel more fast than others. And you can't have them sitting and, you know, twiddling their thumbs. You have to, again, think of, well, how do you entice the, the curriculum for them as well? So from that realization, at the end of the day, you, you come to realize that Industry has shifted as well, not only just for us, but but for the businesses out there where our students go into. And it has set the precedent for me in this time to realize at the same time, we've we've always thought, you know, we need to hear and listen to what industry says. You know, what does industry say so that we can design or not design so that we can teach our students how to design for industry so that, you know, you can find your place in there. But I rethought this process and thought to myself, well, we need to actually, you know, educate our students to reteach the industry, to say to them, Mm -hmm. you know what, these are the things you don't have. We we have our students, but you don't have this. So Uh, check what we have. I fully, I fully agree with you. I mean, industry, I mean, industry at the same time will want, as I have seen many times, will want one student designing one app completely, including the programming, the topography, the the UX, the everything. So yeah, there's one there's industry on the one hand and there's vision and ideals, uh, idealism from another. Welcome Amanda uh, to the, to the Hi, panel. Amanda. Uh, Hi. That was a fantastic uh, presentation. We really enjoyed it. Thank you so much for your, for the presentation. Uh, so the, just to, to reiterate, the question is about, we're talking about our experiences this year and about the online and offline, the analog and digital aspect of design education. And so uh, we're just talking about what happened this year and how we pivoted and how this has worked. Uh, so uh, who wants to go next? Maybe I can sure. talk about a little bit my based on my experience and also like some thoughts about uh, the current situation and analog and digital. It's not something like we can choose one over another. It's kind of, if we go to analog, we are missing some digital. Mm-hmm. And if we move to digital, we are missing some analog touch. So always we go back and forth between two things. You know, For example, I think because of that, the balance is pretty important, really important thing. You know, like this conference, you know, we can all attend at Zoom. At home, you know, we can just listen to everything, YouTube, but you know, we are missing some kind of, you know, the experience, you know, in-person experience with everyone. So if we go to digital, uh, you know, in person next year, hopefully, you know, we will miss some of this element. So we will need always miss the the other parts. So I think the balance is a really important thing. Mm-hmm. So like, just don't try not to lean toward or just believe in one thing. Also, the other thing is, uh, especially the last semester, the spring semester, and this semester, uh, I think the Accessibility is a big keyword because you know everything is many things is accessible like this lecture, video, resources, everything. But uh, sometimes that's not just enough too because there are so much resources out there. But you know someone can serve you the food, but you should feed yourself. Other than that, it's not really useful. So like and. Sometimes, you know, we send our student, here's a link, here's a video, here's an email, but like the other talk, you know, sometimes they don't really like check email or read email well. So uh, it's kind of the challenge how we can encourage our student to, to engage with this experience because sometimes, you know, they stuck at home or they also need to work and they have their own life as well. So like that was kind of particularly a challenge, but I've seen some students thrive in this situation as well. But I think one uh, thing could be kind of resourcefulness, you know, like it is what it is. 
So what we have and what we're going to do sometimes uh, often students like think proactively, like think about like what they're going to do and other stuff, you know. So it's kind of uh, like it's kind of weird time, but, you know, at least uh, we are artists and designers and we are creative professionals. So we are trying to solve the problem. And I'm excited to learn more about how they are doing because we all find a different solutions or a way to work with this. And that will really help uh, all educators to prepare for the next semester. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, also, just one other thing is, uh, you know, in the past, like, like many graphic design courses, you need to print a lot, mm -hmm. but because of the uh, pandemic, we cannot really do much. So I've noticed that like many assignments go to digital, like a screen based, or like just make a mock-up or even use the uh, website. So you just send PDF and they're gonna print the book, bound it and send back. Just if you can tolerate the uh, turnout, you know, about two weeks, you can just send the design, receive it like contact list. So like, uh, I think those resources hopefully will uh, remain there and then we can incorporate those for our education and our, for our student as well. Fantastic, fantastic. I mean, you're talking about the learning styles that are suiting every, everyone, but at the same time, we need to ensure that they understand that this is a dedication. You know, as I say it many times, uh, visual communication graphics is the, is the hard way out. <laughs> It's not the easy way out. Mm -hmm. And I, uh, having been teaching for many years visual communication design, which is quite mm -hmm. broad and open-minded, mm -hmm. uh, I get students coming because they think, okay, this is Viscom, you know, okay, mm -hmm. this is easy. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it's not. <laughs> so yep. it, it, it's quite hard these days to communicate the kind of dedication that's required yeah, by, sure. our, by our courses. Yeah. And in a way, uh, Zoom does not encourage mm -hmm. that kind of dedication, but anyway, fantastic. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. So anyway, yeah. So thank you, Tegyo. And mm -hmm. I mean, my experience from in-person class to virtual class setting, at the beginning, I really struggled to make a transition, but I'm quite positive experience that because I teach UI UX, web design, creative coding, technically, it is possible to teach virtually. But for instance, I had a meeting, in-person meeting with my student yesterday that it took almost two weeks virtually by using Zoom to do discussing, finalizing ideas for in-person in meeting setting. It took just 30 minutes to figure out what's the problem of your design process and what is the direction we have to go. So in-person class is more efficiently, we can communicate with the student. Mm -hmm. So at the end of the meeting, student was very impressed, impressed and surprised that the meeting was ended so quickly, just took less than 20 minutes. And then they were, wow. And they said, so I said, yeah, that's why we need in-person class. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. So anyway, also, I'm a graphic design educator that in this situation, I really care about how to foster virtual supporting system in graphic, ed graphic design education. So I try to encourage my students that you have to support each other uh, to survive during this uncertainty mm -hmm. as a mm -hmm. graphic designer. So I really try to focus on how you can create supporting system for graphic design. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. Amanda? So um, I have a, hi, hi, Hello. sorry. Um, I have a, a bit of a different experience mm. In, mm. in my um, teaching online education. I've been teaching online for about 10 years, <clears throat> but I primarily teach um, history and theory classes, which are classes that do lend themselves really well to online instruction. <clears throat> so I've been teaching about half of my classes online and half of my classes face-to-face -face so that we offer a little bit of variety for our students uh, for enrollment options. <clears throat> and then when we went online, uh, transitioning all my classes online was not a big deal for me. Um, 
But I will say it has been a very big deal for my co-faculty who do primarily teach studio courses and they run into the same issues that you all are describing. Um, I have to say there is a part of me that loves that they were sort of forced into this experience because I have been teaching online for 10 years. And even though I teach history and theory courses, I run into the exact same issues that you were just mentioning where giving feedback and, and trying to diagnose problems and issues with students online takes a tremendous amount of time and energy. It's exhausting. And I've run into this problem where, um, you know, some of the administration has been trying to pack people into my classes where there's this idea that you, it's online, there's unlimited seats. We can pack as many as you want. <laughs> um, and I've been really fighting that. And so I, I really am, like I said, I'm, I'm really kind of glad that, that my co-faculty were sort of forced into that so that they understand where I'm coming from when I keep telling them, you can't just load me down with students. Uh, you know, it, it really interrupts the quality of the feedback and the time that I'm able to give to those students. Um, but yes, a lot of my co-faculty have run into the exact same issues with online instruction in the classroom. Um, students don't participate as well online. Um, they don't give us thorough feedback as you want during critiques and, and you know, sessions like that, idea generating sessions. Um, and one issue that I've run into is Zoom. All of my classes that were would have been face to face are on Zoom, and um, I try to respect their privacy by not forcing them to turn on their cameras. Um, but I do request that they turn on their cameras and I'm very much finding that I'm making, it's hard to make connections with a student in an online setting, no matter what, mm -hmm. but I am making better connections with the students who do turn on their cameras. Um, and, and I'm still stuck with that. Like mm -hmm. I want to make connections with all of the students, but I want to respect their privacy and, you know, and some of them don't have the bandwidth to turn on their cameras all the time. So I want to respect that as well. Um, so I'm real sh still struggling with that. I want to make those connections. I mean, that's why I got into education. I'm sure that's why all of us did. We want Absolutely. to help students. We want Absolutely. to make connections. Absolutely. That's perfectly valid. Hello, Pete. Welcome. Hey, thank uh, you. Hello. We're discussing about our, our path this year and our challenges on, on going from analog into digital, on going, and we're just uh, telling our stories. Hello, Rosina. Welcome as well. So, yeah, I think I wanted to um, share a little bit too on my experience with Zoom and my requirements, which are different than Mandy's. Um, and I make that part of my attendance and participation that their video is on. And I've even made it part of my attendance and participation that they are not in pajamas, that they are not laying in bed covered with a blanket. And I've even explained to them, you know, you're in a fortunate, a very fortunate situation that you have the advantage to just walk into a different room and attend class rather than have to, you know, drive all the way into campus for those that commute, find a place to park, work your way up to the classroom and be there on time. So if they can't be professionally prepared for class in just a different room in their house, um, that's not a good professional practice. Is, and, and I believe that's what we're doing in the universities is, is getting them into that professional practice um, they are absent from class. And I've uh, just gone through midterm grades. And I think a lot of students are going to be surprised when their participation grade is very low, if not, you know, at a failing grade for attendance and participation, just due to that lack of preparation for, for class meetings, whether they're Zoom or online, says the guy who's late to the panel, right? <laughs> 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 I, I just got the email the other day about, about it's how the precise attendance from from Zoom is quite it's quite interesting. Yeah, it's quite interesting. Yeah, I agree with Peter that definitely I have a class manner in my syllabi that at the beginning I have a mutual agreement with my student that I keep the class hour from the beginning to end every section was I request my son always video camera on during class hours. Mm -hmm. Also, I, in my class manner, 
uh, section that I clearly only mentioned about clean up your background mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. always put your face straight away. And some students may try to say leaning one like this. So yeah, definitely I agree with Peter that we need a mutual agreement at the beginning. Absolutely. Okay. Hello, Rosina, how are you? Welcome. Can you Hi, hear us? Well, yes, I can hear you. And fantastic. Thank you. I'm obviously not the only one that was late, so that was good to hear. No worry. <laughs> we had our first question and we are uh, talking about our experiences this year from uh, uh, pivoting from analog to digital into more digital environments of teaching and learning. So mm -hmm. uh, is there something you'd like to say about the experience uh, of, of this? Well, for me, I've always um, done the hybrid because I work mm -hmm. for myself. Mm -hmm. And so I've always been really a lot of contact on the digital spectrum. Um, of course, the you know, missing out on a lot of the conferences and, and, and everything and that human interaction that, that I had also. But in terms of the education of what I've seen, certainly with having three children, um, there's been a big difference between teachers and educators who were very confident with actually the digital spectrum and who kind of straight away jumped into it compared to the ones that were totally afraid of it. Mm. So that whole kind of digital transformation that we've been, I guess, that governments have been talking about investing in over the years, well, boy, did we really see where the gaps were. And I think also that whole um, gap in terms of for the vulnerable. You know, I also have a child, which I spoke about, obviously, in the video that I did earlier on, um, on your session, mm. um, who's special needs. And so there also, you know, there's been a huge gap, of course, of um, youth that don't have access to that digital education, that don't have the access to the computers. And if families have, you know, two or three kids, not every single one has a computer and the parents Absolutely. also Absolutely. working from home. So, I mean, you need then five computers, you know, at home if you've got a family of five or a family of, of four. And even with us being in a luxury situation of having digital access, but having three children, it meant that each one needed that, that access. Mm -hmm. So I think there were so many different interesting observations that came out. And we've seen some great initiatives from community coming together where they were raising funds and contact, contacting corporates to um, get, oops, sorry, to get old computers and mm. to um, really help on, on social causes to, you know, try and bridge that gap. Absolutely. So I have a lot of passionate thoughts about that, you know, and I think mm. governments and institutions need to do so much more to bridge mm -hmm. that divide. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the, the, the another another thing I've been thinking about is that uh, having participated over this year in many national and international dialogues about uh, about pivoting, um, the, the the discussions are very rarely from a student uh, from a student perspective. So it, it seems, especially from an administration point of view, it seems that the student is is absent on all the decision making. So how can we um, how can we get the discussion? to be more student-centered rather than, than less? We need to ask them. We need to reach out. We need to get that feedback from them. You know, I think we need to be communicating and having feedback from educators and our students together, perhaps. Yeah, but for example, you have, you have now you have... Uh, certain countries uh, insisting that all studios are uh, physical, yeah? And so there's the safeguarding design in many ways. Say, look, design is done one-to-one -one physical process. It will take all the precautions and we'll look after the student because we'll explain to the student that design is done uh, on, on a one-to-one, -one, one -one. it's not taught via Zoom. Other, other, other universities and countries are either by force or by choice, moving to, to completely 100% online. But in all these processes, usually the student is not present. They're not. So uh, who wants to take the questions again? I think oh. um, if I may, I'll just kind of start. I don't know if I'm going to be able to answer the question, but I want to put more into the thought process of mm -hmm. what we need to consider. Um, 
our university, for example, is uh, we, when we come to the design classes, we definitely focus more on um, process and theory and methodology to a certain degree. And I, and I think it's it's being able to separate those because there's some universities where they have very specific classes that might be based around, here's some software, here's how we use the software, here's what we build with the software, knowing your design principles and your design um, uh, ideas or whatever it might be, here's what we build with software. So it's very functional, practical kind of based classroom teaching. And I think that can lend itself well to online, but then the problem becomes, are students actually using the software? Mm -hmm. uh, so for example, um, I have a intro class where we are talking about methodology and process and we do some demonstration, very little demonstration because we're not there to teach software, we're there to teach theory, methodology uh, and design process. Um, and we show some software, but then when it comes to, now we're doing a hybrid, so we have online and in-person classes. When the students show up into the in-person classes, nothing has been done. And they haven't even used the software to practice the demonstration that's happened. So my more successful classes are purely the theory-based classes where it's mostly design thinking, um, design methodologies, putting, putting things in practice into planning, strategy, organization, and not the execution part. And then those students are doing really well because they understand well, I have to build outside the classroom. So I, I think the models that, I think there's a variety of models in design teaching. And I think that's where the inconsistency or lack of clarity as to how we need to execute this, because as, um, as Rosina was saying, some are ready to just jump into that digital world and like, yeah, we can totally do that. Because I think that course is really set up for that opportunity. Even Amanda, um, who's been teaching online, um, she's gone through the trials and turmoils of what's working, what's not working. Um, so that that pivot almost becomes second nature, where, where those that have never really been in, in an online atmosphere, whether learning on their own or teaching, um, you know, it, it, it becomes a little bit more difficult to understand the transition to do so. I've been fortunate enough where I had a lot of online learning and a good amount of online teaching. So I was kind of in the middle. And even what I thought was going to work really well and what was easy to execute ended up not working. And it's something that I've done before at a different university with different students in a different region of the United States. And it worked really well. So I also think it it's so tied to our particular student body and their demographics and where they're coming from and what their experiences are. And it's it's really hard. I think each university does have to make their own decisions. Mm. But Lefteris, as you're saying, we need the student voice mm. to know it's not working. Because so many of my students are like, we're so confused. Yeah. Because in your class, you're doing A. In my other class, we're doing B. They've got five classes and everyone's doing something different. So there's no no formal understanding or consistency that they need to follow. Absolutely, that's that's very important. Mm -hmm. Can I can I comment on that? Please, sure, sure. Um, yeah, Peter, I, I fully agree um, with what you're saying, and we have faced the same you know type of situation from our students. I think what's what happened with our students as well is that what we mentioned earlier is. We try to support them in many instances as possible in terms of data and you know having them be connected, but some just don't have network coverage, even if you give them as much data as you possibly can. So what we had to resource on as well is to set up not only you know devices for them um, in terms of iPads and additional third-party apps that in you know with the whole fee structure was feasible, but 
at the same time with what you mentioned about, you know, the uncertainty with students is we, we set up, for example, an ERT type of briefing manual, basically just, you know, setting up a manual so that the students can see, you know, doing almost like a collaborative um, project base between different modules, um, saying that so from the one module, they've got deliverables on the one thing, on the one thing and the other, and they speak to one another. But at the same time, they can see what are the consultation times between one lecturer and another so that that confusion starts to be, you know, you know, put aside so that they know exactly these are my consultation times and this is what I'm doing for one module and it's not for nothing because that's also what sometimes came, came out is that students think, okay, so why am I doing this in terms of what I'm doing with other things? And then there's this weird uncertainty as what you also speak about. And then, you know, you're like, okay, but this is the reason they go, yeah, I know, but <laughs> why exactly? And then you go, okay, this is the reason. And then, okay, they need to see it, you know, like on black and white on paper to go, okay, this is what I need to do. This is what my outcomes are. This is what I'm going to get assessed on. And, and that process of actually giving them a manual and say, listen, here's your remote manual that you're going to work on. And then you know what you're going to do remotely. And, you know, when you are on campus is something that worked. But at the same time, you had to almost set it up to such an extent that you have a lot of leeway because you, you don't know what's going to happen. Will campus close? Will it open again? So that, you know, you can't plan and say, okay, we'll be back. You know, everybody next week we're in class, all thumbs up. And then, oh, wait, we can't go back. And then it's a screw up because then what are you going to do? So you need to, you know, factor in so many additional things. Mm -hmm. And as you rightly say as well, that the process was more so in line to idealization and, and conceptualizing and thinking about the problem and delving into that in terms of, you know, cognitive development, soft skills, looking at, you know, how can you unpack the scenario? And then when you've got the resources, yes, then you start to implement to a greater degree. And that again is again where the problem comes in because you can't just have the student just rely on, you know, just the theory components and the idealization, they have to do the physical things. And that's where we said, we've got this catch 22 at the end of the day as well, but there is a great need for both. But I think that we have to think about, you know, how do we restructure this for 2021, 2022, the curriculum to say, so how do we cater for both? So that if there's an issue, we know we can jump back to point A or B, and we know we can facilitate and aid the student so that there isn't a lack of, knowledge gained or skill gained. I think I've noticed, um, and uh, I want to know if anyone else has had a similar problem, that what I wanted to accomplish in this semester is probably three weeks, if not more, kind of behind schedules where I wanted it to be. And it's mostly, and it's not it's not due to me not delivering material. It's to me that I have to hold off because the students aren't progressing in a manner that should be acceptable. And I'm really at kind of a, um, a crossroads of, of what decision to make on that and how to move forward. And it is unfortunate that I think our students are, I don't think they're getting a lesser education because of the situation we're in. But I think they're I think they're taking in a lesser education. So there's definitely a big problem there. Absolutely, because because the experience is, is lacking. Exactly. On, on a physical studio, we're creating an experience. Uh, our teaching is not information. In fact, it's everything but information. And mm -hmm. and and this thing right now is really uh, uh, transmitting information. Well, how much of how much of the the onus is on the students of applying themselves to it. So an online Zoom meeting that's two hours and 40 minutes long is absolutely insane. So even though my studio classes are two hours and 40 minutes, I will only run a 50 to 60, sometimes um, an hour and 10 minutes max Zoom meeting. Mm. And I don't know how many times after the Zoom meetings I have brought up the fact of like, okay, you still have an hour's worth of class because you are scheduled in that time slot Absolutely. where if you were on campus, please use your time wisely. And I, I definitely can understand from what's coming into the classroom that perhaps they're, they're not. Perhaps it's coffee time, nap time, play with the cat or something like that. And um, 
you know, I'd like to think greater um, opportunities from students. Uh, however, it is that disconnect of that not being in the physical presence and going through that experience. And you've mentally set that time apart and you have student colleagues there that are working with you that entire time mm. where when a Zoom meeting is over, you're alone again. And then how do you how do you continue that communication or that that learning process in your mind? Absolutely. Yeah. So let me share my online teaching experience that again compared with Amanda that I started teaching online this year, this spring. That anyway, a uh, good news is that I use virtual office hour. Mm -hmm. I set up my virtual office hour at calendarly.com. Whenever they may want, they can sign up automatically. Whenever they sign up, it would calendarly. I do, I'm not promoting calendarly.com, but I mean, anyway. sponsorship. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I'm using all kinds of existing platform yeah. to make uh, my students connect uh, with me. That that is a one part way also. Uh, go back to your initial question, how we would teach student-centered, how, how we would offer student-centered education. Again, it takes time a lot, but individually, I care for e each student to have their own critical thinking as a designer, rather than providing a uh, direct direction, like a change the color. Absolutely, what, of course. What do you think about that? Absolutely. Why you use this color scheme? What's the purpose? What's the goal? That it really take time if I care each student to foster their critical thinking as a designer. Also, I try to inject, I don't want to use expression inject, but I try to educate each student in graphic design to have their own vision mm. as a designer. Vision, leadership, responsibility to the society as a designer. It really take time. And, but that is my just a primary teaching philosophy beyond by using Zoom or in-person. Absolutely. Way. Yeah. Absolutely. Oh, oh, can I just add something? Also, I do believe that we can't underestimate the impact of this period on our students. And so indeed that whole kind of lack of human connection. And I've noticed also the difference it makes when there's an educator who will also ask the children or the youth or the older students, how they feel, how are they? Reaching out also on a human level. During, um, I think it was during the Easter holidays, we still had a lockdown here and one of my son's um, educators actually dropped by with social distancing on a bike to each of his 14 students around Brussels just to hand a personal note. Now, I'm not saying that's what every educator has to do, but he also left videos for them recorded of just talking about what a challenging time this was. If they need anything, they're there for them. And just don't don't be too hard on yourself. You know, really this kind of emotional intelligence, tapping into that. And I think that made a huge difference compared to one who was maybe, it was just coming in, doing the class, going. So I think this kind of connection, we can still try and create um, on a digital level. And it still, I think, resonates. And it's still very much what's needed during this time. Don't know what your thoughts are. You, you've highlighted one, one of the well, a very important point uh, mm -hmm. is that we cannot have the same expectations, and that's and that's you know all, all of the students during this period. So and that's something I think all of us are are building into our teaching. But uh, this is your your forum. Oh. I agree with you. Yes, take them. Yeah. Oh, I just like to add something. You know, like when. Like spring semester, we when we suddenly switched to online, like the expectation was okay, like we're gonna use Zoom so they can student our student can see us and listen to us and so they can learn. But like I'm sure you all agree with that somehow, like that's not how we teach and learn because you know we are using 
the vision and hearing, but actually when you walk into the classroom, like Pete said, like you take a shower, dress up, walk or drive to you know, classroom, which means you are get prepared yourself and like immersive and have an immersive experience there. It's not just kind of listen to that, hearing that like it, the learning and teaching happens with some sort of in the environment and also involved with some kind of muscle memory as well, especially the design education without like doing it, like it's not really, it makes sense because for example, like cooking video, when you see the cooking video, it's magically done. And then like, it feels like you can do that, but you know, that's not a true, like just Brilliant. giving the recipe is not the right thing. Brilliant. And also when you have the, although you know how to use a recipe after that, you can like tweak it and customize it and like, uh, you know, make your own recipe based on that. Like, I think that's what sh students should do. Brilliant. So like we may need some kind of for learning and teaching. Like we are not just like, for, for example, one thing is I'm teaching my class as a hybrid. So mm. I see my student at least once a week, but they all wearing the masks and I have a really hard time reading their faces. Like, and then, but I try my all the senses to read their emotions. So like, I'm, you know, almost developing a sixth sense or something, you know, <laughs> but like a Zoom or something as well. Like we are like what Amanda said, like we are using our all senses to pay attention to like their facial emotion in Zoom or how they dress. We are kind of really trying hard, but interesting thing is in classroom, we, we naturally get that right away. So like, I, I don't know how to describe it, but I, I believe we all agree with that, you know, that we have some other senses to Absolutely. sensing Absolutely. the emotion there. And students would, might have the same thing too. Yeah, so. I would fully agree with that. And I didn't realize that until you said that, that I haven't had that emotion or experience at all this semester uh, with in hybrid online and in class. So I haven't had that in class moment with them where I've been teaching this, my 12th year teaching, and I can think of numerous times where you just sense it. You just know you have to like ask some questions, find out what they're thinking. And you, you know, they need more, but they don't want to ask or inquire on it, or they need a little guidance. So I know, I know exactly what you're referring to. Uh, and that's definitely missing this this semester and it, it a lot might have to do with the the face coverings it might have to do with when we do have a moment to be in the classroom we're trying to get them to execute more than we're trying to deliver theory uh content um but that's a really good point for sure amanda have you got something to to add to this conversation that's a... well i just i want to speak a little bit more to <clears throat> excuse me, getting feedback from students. And mm. um, and I think that that is certainly very important and they do need to be brought into the conversation. And it is hard to figure out exactly how to bring them in and when to bring them in. Um, but I, I've, I think we can be strategic about it. Um, and like, uh, for example, I really emphasized last spring how important my evaluations were for them. And I was going to go over them thoroughly and look for any feedback about this because we were pretty sure we were going to be doing that in the fall. Um, and one of the, you know, just an example, one of the things that they mentioned was that I spoke too quickly. Um, so, you know, I really, I really tried to pay attention to that and work on that. I also, they requested more, I always give my students a break, even in the classroom, um, but they requested more shorter breaks instead of one long break. Um, and so I, I worked that in as well. Um, I just also an idea on, um, on how to, uh, you know, make those connections uh, in a, maybe a studio class and getting the feedback like, you know, um, you know, the the crit critique and the answers and response of why did you choose that color? What were you thinking? And that sort of thing is, um, you know, Pete had said that he doesn't make them stay in Zoom for two hours and 40 minutes or whatever. Um, but maybe maybe we use some of that class time to have either individual sessions with students um, to make sure that they do get some of that either one-on-one -on -one feedback, or maybe we make smaller cohorts, um, you know, groups of, of three or four where we 
uh, really dig mm -hmm. into the meat of, of the assignment or the project that they're working on with them um, and set up time schedules using the calendar.com or, or, mm -hmm. or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. Just some thoughts. Yeah, I yeah, definitely. I use my class hour fully to provide lecture, workshop, demo, so group critique, one to discussion intensively. Yes, I invited each student to breakout room to provide uh, each individual approach. Definitely, yeah, I agree with you, Amanda. Yes. Yeah, I I too have utilized the breakout rooms um, after my my lecture time. And I have found that to be beneficial, uh, for sure. Another thing that I've done, and um, I, I think that I'm going to now with our conversation is have one at the end of the semester, but I always have in the beginning of the semester, I use Google Forms, and I've created my own questions from my heart and my mind to my students in preparation for the semester to kind of get a sense of where everybody's at. They've even been questions as to how's your internet connection? What computer do you have at your disposal? How familiar are you with using online meeting tools? What's your favorite platform? Facebook, FaceTime, uh, Google Meet, or whatever those might be. Uh, and I've asked those personal questions as to how are you doing um, with everything? Are you doing well? Is your family doing well? Um, in through this conversation, I do believe that now I'm going to possibly even have a midterm one, but definitely have an end of semester um, feedback and ask those questions like, what could we do differently? So I'll collect them personally, but I think maybe it would be a good idea for our departments to have conversations from all our faculty say, let's, let's gather this information from all of our classes and let's compile it it doesn't matter if we all use the same questions. I think we can use varying questions without a problem um, and go ahead and then kind of analyze that at the end of the semester during that like final faculty meeting and then make some um, addressing changes. And then perhaps even the chairs or the heads of our departments can take those to the college level and to the university level. So that might be as Lefteris is asking, like how do we you know, how do we manage this? But maybe that's a place to start, you know. Uh, it always has to start with the individual and um, become a collective. So I think that's what I'm going to do personally is um, introduce some new uh, Google Forms that mm -hmm. can collect some data and then see if our department's willing to participate in at least an end of semester uh, version. Because we, we all know that we'll be back in this scenario for spring. Um, and we all hope that by next fall of, of 2021 that we're beyond this moment. But I also know that uh, um, from a conversation that I've had um, with my colleague, we're gonna be continuing some of the ways that we teach and learn now. Um, and we're gonna have more opportunity to do student meetings via um, these opportunities where they are online Zoom opportunities rather than you know meeting in the office, like a student can't get to campus or something for some reason. It's like, this is a great idea where we can still have these advising meetings or other meetings um, via the technology. So the technology now may have not been there before, but I think going forward, it's gonna be part of our, our everyday um, mm -hmm. way we operate. Fantastic. I, mean, if I can also just comment on, on possibly just on what Peter said and also on what uh, Rosina said and Amanda earlier is one of the things that also worked for us to a great extent as well as just to connect on the human level first it was also to structure like two to three sessions in a week just with students bodies and just talk to them just have we call it just like a chat time so that those want to log in log in and you hear you know how's it going what are the struggles connectivity issues personal issues whatever the case might be and then with you know those lectures also like Amanda said and you also said you know the students have a, a very small attention span so you know you do these little bursts of classes and you know content driven stuff and then what also then worked is to say okay well you know what, now I've got 10 minutes to do, you know, your own reflection about, you know, one another's work. So do like a peer review session and, you know, then you sit back and then they go, okay, cool. Now they've got ownership. So the moment when they almost got again ownership of saying, you know, I've got this online means, I can now give a voice. 
you know, they, they take it and they grasp it to a full extent, which, which aided them greatly in terms of their own development and thinking process without just doing, but thinking about it. And, you know, coming back to that human component and then, you know, giving feedback is the moment you really, you know, embark on asking them, listen, what are the struggles? Irrespective of just of, you know, the class situation environment, but what are the things you are struggling with? And rightly, as you said, you know, with the Google Forms as well, we've realized that, you know, we've given, you know, many attributes um, and platforms for students to work on and say, okay, these are the things that you can work on from a PC to this, to these devices and platforms. And then we realized that there's a lack of communication on various things. So where was it that the students find, you know, a pleasure or comfort in working on? And ironically is most of them like to use WhatsApp. In our situation, that's what they wanted to use. So that you realize, okay, so all the other stuff is there, but right, fine, if you want to use WhatsApp, so let's, let's use it. So then we restructured again our communication channels, feedback channels again to that platform. But it was very necessary um, because if we didn't ask, we didn't you know, inquire about it, we would have been you know, none the wiser. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, so is there any aspect of, of today that you anybody would like to discuss uh, in particular? Uh, so we can sort of have an open conversation about uh, today's event and the sessions and uh, each other's presentations or other people, other people's presentations. I've been, I've been enjoying watching them. I thought the keynote was a great uh, a great start. And I liked um, the discussion about the um, practice to practitioner uh, moment of, of, of what he was speaking to. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, I found, um, I found that as well. I think the keynote was very nicely structured in terms of, you know, as I've mentioned, that ORM, that, that loop of, of working processes. But at the same time, when I listen to all the other, other talks, it's, you know, it's not only inspiration, but it's also it gives you an excitement of wanting to collaborate. Um, I commented on on Pete and, and Amanda. I, I've commented on you know how great a project that is, and and that the scope can can just branch out far more than you know what you're currently working on. So I'll wait that Thank you publish you. that that you do it in 2022, and then we've got everything done, then we can do another one in a short time. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Yes, I, I yes, I agree with that. I think that project has a great potential as a multidisciplinary project beyond the documentary film. That I think graphic design community and other community would be very welcome to collaborate with you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we Mandy and I have had many conversations about um, the the opportunity that this has in understanding that you know a full a full length feature documentary film of about an hour and 20 minutes or an hour and 40 minutes doesn't give you much window to really cover this in the depth that it needs to be covered. Um, it, even if it, we talk about diversity and race and uh, economic standings, whether it's um, in, in Europe, in Asia, in India, or wherever it might be in the world and, and what that looks like and how different that would vary across the globe. So yeah, Mandy and I've had like, wow, there's so much to talk about here. You know, how do we find that little moment where we can talk about this in a, in a short documentary film and the opportunity for, for growth on it is, is an expansion. We've even talked about a series. Yeah. So, um, so we're talking about Netflix series. <laughs> I was saying that's yeah, fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah. Because, yeah. Let me just share that yeah. I'm working with a multidisciplinary project, social homelessness on U.S. campuses. That I think it also relate with your documentary film, like social homelessness of female in design area historically. That because initially my multidisciplinary project, social homelessness on U.S. campuses, was inspired by a documentary feeling to bring awareness of a diversity issue on mm -hmm. campuses. Then I extended that project to Corella projection, site-specific installation, mobile application, social gathering. I think your project has a huge potential. I would be welcome to talk more about this project with your team. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, yeah thank you. Yeah. Feel free to reach out, send an email, and we'll, we'll talk more for sure. Anyone yes. that's interested. Yeah, thank you, I will. Anyone else would like to say something of, of just as a general comment? You're okay? I can say just generally, I yeah. really enjoyed it, uh, yeah. Lifthouse. Really fantastic. enjoyed it. The keynote was fantastic and uh, thoroughly enjoyed it. And also, well, it's all because of you. It's all because of, of you. you. Yes. Fantastic, fantastic. Well, we are already preparing for Monday. We'll be preparing for uh, Design Education Forum 2021. So, again, ideas and suggestions to make this even 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 bigger and better uh, is uh, welcome and we're back in less than 15 hours so i i do apologize for the u.s time but i try to create uh, two sessions like u.s and europe roughly uh, but every presentation even this this uh, panel will be available on youtube uh, from friday night so all the presentations, all the speeches, everything you saw today will be there. It'll be, it'll be unlocked, they'll be unlocked. And uh, thank you so much for coming. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you, thank yes, you. Thank, thank you. you. Fantastic, thank fantastic you. conference. Thank and thank you, you to everybody. Thank, thank you. you, it was brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.